All of you, welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. If you would remain standing today, welcome. Thank you. If you would remain standing today for the reading of God's Word, I want to begin today's message by reading a couple of verses in Luke chapter 9, verses 16 through 17. It says, And taking, speaking about Jesus, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. I hope that you have come here to see God's blessings and His provisions. I hope you have come to see Him do amazing things. Would you join me in prayer today? Father, we praise You. Holy Spirit, we praise Your name. God, we are grateful that today, in this very moment, we know that Your powerful, mighty Holy Spirit is right here in this room. That we know because of You, there is hope present in this place right now. That because of who You are, there is peace that is in this room. That there is joy overflowing because You are here. Because of what You're about to do in our hearts, we know that today some of us will find your freedom. Today some of us will be encouraged and equipped by you to know exactly what you desire for our lives. Today we're going to be renewed in you, spiritually provided for. Holy Spirit, we praise you that you are in our midst. And God, we give this time to you. Would you move in our midst? Would you bring us conviction where we need to be changed and transformed? Would you help us see you today? God, we have come to see you. We have come to be touched by you. We have come to be renewed by you. Jesus, we give ourselves to you today to do with us as you please. This is your church. And we as your people give ourselves to you. In your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How is my favorite service doing today? Okay. Don't tell them I said that. Don't tell the other services I said that, okay? I am so glad you're here. I want to begin today's message in an unusual way with an unusual story, but I want you to hold on to this story because I'm going to come back to it, okay? Can you guys hold on to it? Good. This side can. So when I, you have heard me say when I was growing up in Iran, I, I was raised in Tehran mostly, and as I was growing up, we were living in a very, on a very busy street. Every minute, there would be hundreds of people passing by, and I've told you this before too, that I, I enjoyed sitting at the window watching people. Now, being that we lived in the busy street, on a busy street, there was, this, there was this woman who would walk on our streets, not just a regular woman, there was this crazy woman who walked on our street back and forth. And when I tell you crazy, I don't do the word justice. In fact, uh, every time I read stories in the Bible, like two weeks ago, we saw in Luke chapter 8 that Jesus healed a, the man, a man who was demon-possessed. You guys remember? He had 6,000 demons in him called Legion. Every time I read stories in the Bible about demon-possessed people, this woman becomes my point of reference. She was not just crazy, but she would walk on the street cussing as she walked she would say the foulest words you could ever imagine she would she would look at you and if she looked at you she would say the foulest things that I can't say in the church if you looked at her she would attack you if you walked too close to her she would beat the heck out of you and she was tiny but she was super strong on one occasion and I'm not making this up on one more occasion she was walking by our uh, on our street by our front door and my dad's car was parked there and she kicked my dad's car the passenger door and put a huge dent in the car nevertheless my whole family was grossly scared of this woman now hold on to that i'm going to come back to it okay if you have your bibles open up your bibles to the gospel of luke chapter 9 today we're going to look at 10 verses starting with verse 7 if you do not have a bible keep your hands up let our ushers see you so they can bring you a copy and if you're using your phones put them on do not disturb mode airplane mode however it is that, that you just make sure you are not distracting other people i was 
I was thinking of this passage, and um, last week our elders, Rick and Frank, did an amazing job preaching to you from chapters 8, 9, and 10. Yeah, give them a round of applause. They, they brought you a 30,000-foot view of these three chapters. Now, I was just going to go to chapter 10 and continue on, but the Lord convinced me that we got to stay here for a while and savor these moments. And I realized I am not in a hurry to finish the Gospel of Luke, are you? I mean, we might as well just enjoy it even if it takes us 20 years. So, so it, open up your Bibles to chapter 9, but before we dive into God's Word, I want to ask you a self-examination question. And before I ask you, though, I want to make sure that you really search your hearts with this, because we ask you questions, we ask you to really look into your hearts, but this question is not just a general question. It is really for a day-to-day. -day. Every morning you wake up, every morning you wake up, you've got to ask yourself this. And I want you to ask yourself, what am I really looking for? Ask yourself the question, what am I really looking for? And you may say, well, I am at church, so I must be looking for Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that why I'm here? No, what I'm asking you is a bit more than that. What are you really here for? Some of you may say, well, I came to worship. That's good. But for some of you, maybe your wife, your husband, your parents dragged you to church. For some of you, maybe you came because you think it's an obligation. I got to go to church to be blessed. For some of you, maybe you're looking for something that God would do for you. Maybe you feel broken. Maybe you're in a desolate place. Maybe you feel you need to be touched by God. That's why you came to church. But what are you really here for? What are you really looking for? If you would wake up in the morning and your memory would be all stripped away from you, what would your body, your flesh look for first? Would that be God? Or would that be something else? What are you really looking for? And let me ask you, as you're thinking about that, okay, let me ask you another question. Anybody here excited about the Word of God being preached in the house of God today? That, that's why you are my favorite service, just so you know. Okay, so as you open your Bibles, in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, here's what we saw. We saw that Jesus sent His disciples out as, an, as apostles, and He gave them power and authority to cast out demons. He gave them power to go, to go heal people. But at the same time, the main task that they had was to go proclaim the gospel to the people. And we will see in the verse that we start with that that's what they did. Verse 7. It says, Now Herod the Tetrarch, keep the verse on the screen for me, okay? Let me pause for a moment. Herod the Tetrarch, Herod was a wannabe king. Herod was a guy who was in charge of the Jews of the time. But any of you who know the Roman history, you know that the real emperor, the real king was Caesar at the time. So Herod the Tetrarch says, heard about all that was happening, meaning that the disciples were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And he was perplexed. He was confused about it. Because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead. Now let me, let me stop for a moment. We will see that he was the one who killed John the Baptist. Some of you may remember that. Verse 8 says, by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Verse 9 is very important to what we are going to study today. He said, Herod said, John, now help me out with this, John I, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he, help me out with this, and he, and he sought to see him. He sought to see Jesus. Now some of you may be sitting here and say, isn't that a good thing? He's seeking to see Jesus. Isn't that a good thing? I mean, I know there's Bible scholars sitting in this room right now. Some of you have memorized the Bible back and forth. You know everything about the Bible. And you have memorized Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. And you read in there, it says, Seek and you shall find. I say, well, 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 isn't that a good thing that he was seeking for Jesus? Well, the problem is he wasn't really seeking for Jesus to worship Jesus. Instead, the clue is found, look back, go back to verse 9 real quick. It says, Herod said, John I, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I'm hearing such things? And he sought to see Jesus. He wanted Jesus to come to him and to be subject to him. Now, if you're note takers, I got a few things for you to write down today, okay? The first lesson I have for you, by the way, if you're not note takers, I still encourage you to take notes because taking notes allows you to remember things. But if you miss any of them, don't worry, there's copies in the back. There's going to be a link underneath the sermon for you, on, on the YouTube link for you, that you can download the notes. But if you're a note taker, write this down. The first lesson of the day is this. How you seek Jesus determines how you find Him. How you seek determines how you find. Now, some of you, now you may say, what does that mean? Some of you are looking for Jesus, but the wrong way. 
Some of you are looking for hope, but you're looking for it the wrong way. Some of you are looking for joy, you're looking at the wrong places. Some of you are looking for peace, but you're looking at wrong places. How you look determines how you find. Now, when I was growing up, when I was growing up in Iran, we lived on this busy street, and, and my, mom, my mom was highly Islamically religious. She was a very devout Muslim. And she would go to these temples all the time, the Islamic temples. On one occasion, when my mom went to one of the particular temples that was designated to her Shiite Muslim sects that she was a part of, she was talking to a woman who was even more devout than she was. And this woman convinced my mom and told my mom, she said, if you wake up every morning at 4 a.m. in the morning before the Islamic call, the prayer goes off, and you get a bucket of water, you get a broom, you make yourself presentable, put your head covering on, and you go outside. Remember, we lived in a big city. Go outside to the front door, and you would wash the front door and sweep it, and then pray. On the 40th day, the 12th caliph of the Shiite Muslims, Shiite Muslims believe Mahdi, the 12th caliph, was taken to heaven. They are still waiting for him to come for the end times. The 12th caliph is going to come visit you. The holy man of God is going to come visit you on the 40th day, and he's going to grant you whatever you're looking for. So my mom, for 40 days, diligently, she did this. Without missing a beat, she would wake up every morning, put her head covering on, she would get her bucket of water, get her broom, she would go to the front door, wash the front step, sweep it, she would pray. For 40 days, she did this diligently. Finally, the 40th day arrived. She was excited. She woke up that morning ready to have her wishes granted. She was excited. She put her head covering on, made herself presentable. After all, the holy man of God was coming to see her. She made herself presentable, put her head covering on, took her bucket of water, took her broom. She went and opened the front door. Remember that crazy lady I was telling you about? <laughs> As she opened the front door, five feet from her was standing the crazy lady waiting for somebody to open the door. When my mom opened the door, she froze when she saw her. The woman didn't say a word. The woman didn't attack her. Instead, she leaned forward and she said, Hi. <laughs> to which my mom slammed the door at her face. She ran upstairs screaming. Why am I telling you this story? Because if you look for a psycho God, you're going to find a psycho God. If you look for a genie in the bottle, you're going to find a genie in the bottle. If you go for a God who's going to make you do stupid things so that he would grant you your wishes, you're going to find that God. The question is, are you looking for a silly God or are you looking for the real Jesus, the Savior of the world? What kind of a God are you looking for? That is the question you got to ask yourself because for so many of us, we are looking for the wrong God. And that was the, that was the condition in which Herod was in. He sought to see Jesus, but he didn't see, seek to see Jesus because he wanted to worship him. Instead, if, instead, if you don't believe me, look at Luke chapter 23. We're going to get there in a year or so at some point. We'll get there, okay? But Luke chapter 23, when Jesus was arrested, in verse 8 through 11, it says, When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. Listen to this. Here's a clue. And he was, help me out with this, hoping to see some sign done by him. He was looking for a clown. He was not looking for a savior. But when Jesus didn't do what he wanted, so he questioned him at some length. But Jesus, he made no answer. The chief priests and the, the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him. If you're looking for a God who is a genie, you're looking in the wrong place. And the thing is, if you're questioning God today, saying, God, I pray to you, you didn't answer me. God, why aren't you there when I need you? God, why aren't you doing this when I need you? You know what God is going to do? Jesus is going to remain silent because Jesus doesn't speak to the fools. And when you treat him and mock him, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be made the biggest fool when he walks out of that tomb. Or when he comes back the second time to judge the world, when every knee bows before him, you're going to be the one who is a fool because you have doubted who he is. You guys still with me? Yes. We're not done yet. We've got some more ways to go. Okay, verse 10. Okay, verse 10. But hold on to the story of Herod. We're going to come back to that in a bit. Verse 10 says, 
on their return, so remember, Jesus sent the disciples out as apostles, okay? On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. Now, keep the verse on the screen. They come and tell Jesus everything that they have done, but notice Jesus doesn't tell anything to them yet. Doesn't, doesn't say, well, good job, well done. Look, because there's more for them to do. Verse 10 still says, And Jesus, he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. So they come and say, hey, Jesus, we have done everything you've asked us, but Jesus doesn't tell them anything. Instead, he takes them to a town called Bethsaida because they're still not done learning. Bethsaida, I know there's Bible scholars in this room, but this detail matters, okay? This detail is very important. For those of you who don't know what it means, Bethsaida literally translates to this, house of provision, house of fish, or house of hunting. Altogether, it simply means it's a place where things are provided. It's a place where God provides for you. So Jesus takes the disciples. This is a very important detail. He withdraws to a place called house of provision. I wonder, I wonder how many of you are sitting in God's provision and you're questioning, God, where are you? I wonder how many of you have received all the good things of God. It's right before you, right in front of you. You're standing in it and you say, like, God, why aren't you coming through? Why aren't you blessing me? All the while you're in it. Verse 11, when the crowds learned it, when the crowds learned where Jesus was, this is so important. They did what? Keep the verse on the screen for me. Notice Herod sought to see Jesus, but the crowds, when they learned about him, they followed Jesus. If you're seeking Jesus, what you do is you follow him to find him. You don't wait for Jesus to enter your condition. You go to him so that he can enter your condition. If you're really looking for Jesus, you go to where he is. You go to seek for him. You go to look for him. You go to find him. You don't wait for him to come. Hey, when are you going to show up, Jesus? Go to where he is, and when people go to find him, it says, when the crowds learned it, they followed him, and, they, and he welcomed them. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Listen, if you have genuinely come here today to be with Jesus, he's going to welcome you. He's going to heal you spiritually. He's going to heal you emotionally. He's going to heal you physically. He's going to touch you. He's going to bless you. He's going to tell you about the kingdom. But if you have only come here, to really find Him. Verse 12 is very important. I want to make sure you touch, touch your neighbor say, wake up, this is the time you got to listen. Okay? <laughs> Verse 12 is very important. It says, now, now the day began to wear away. Some of you may read this and say, wow, this Luke guy who is writing this gospel, he's really poetic in the way he's expressing himself. Man, the Holy Spirit really like touching him. He's writing in a poetic way. The day began to wear away. Why didn't it just say the day was about to end? There's a reason behind it. It means that the disciples were tired. They were weary. The day began to become tiresome for them. The day began to wear away. Now watch this. And the, now help me out with this. And the, and the 12, the 12 disciples and the 12 came to him and said to him, very important, very important. Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get... Provision. Remember what Bethsaida meant? House of provision. Disciples come and say, hey Jesus, send them away to find provision. Meanwhile, they're standing in the house of provision. For we are here, important, in a... For we are in a desolate place. Jesus, send the crowd away. We are in a desolate place. I know, I know it's called Bethsaida. We don't care. It's a desolate place. Send them away to find themselves something to eat, find provision. I love verse 13, but before I read it, the second thing I want you to write down, second lesson, okay? How you go to God determines how you receive His instructions. If you go to God and say, oh, God, what do you want me to do? You're going to apply his instructions with a bad attitude. But if you go to God with a heart that is ready to receive instructions, then you're going to be able to see that when he gives you instructions for your own good, you actually win in the situation. But for many of us, we go to God and say, God, what is it that you want me to do? We have a bad attitude about it. How you go to God determines how you receive and apply his instructions in your life. Verse 13, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. Oh, hold on a second, Jesus. What, what, what? We came to you, brought our issue to you, and said, you give them something to eat? You give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. Jesus, this is all we got. 
Can I give you a side note real quick? Side note, you give him something to eat. Can I give you a side note? Can you hold on to the message? We'll come back to it. Can I give you a side note? Three people, three people. Okay. The rest of you won't remember. Yeah. Can I give you a side note real quick? Just a bonus, yeah. bonus. Okay. Jesus tells him, hey, you give him something to eat. And I have a concern for the church. And I don't mean about life point. I, don't, I mean church in general. The Western church, the church globally, I have a concern because it seems to me so many of us, we go to church, but yet we read these stories, we, we are fascinated by these biblical stories that we read, and to us they are nothing but fantastical stories because we say, well, I have never seen Jesus heal a blind man. I have never seen Jesus cast out demons like he did in chapter 8. I've never seen Jesus heal Jairus' daughter like he did in chapter 8. I've never seen a woman who was bleeding for 12 years to find healing. I have never seen a lame walk. I have never seen him do these miraculous things. Maybe, just maybe, those stories that we read are nothing but fantastical stories. Maybe those were the things that Jesus did when he was alive in the flesh. Maybe they don't apply. In fact, there are denominations right now, I'm not going to tell you their names because I don't want to promote them, that they come and say the, the miracles of Jesus ended with Jesus. Listen, I don't know what Jesus you worship. I don't know what God you're looking for, but the Jesus that I worship is the same Jesus that parted the sea when the Israelites were in the pickle. The Jesus that I worship is the same Jesus that, that walked with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel as they were in the fire. Is the same Jesus that shut the mouth of the lion when Daniel was throwing the lions. Then it's the same Jesus who told Lazarus to walk out of the tomb and the dead man began to walk. That is the Jesus that I worship. So I don't really know what kind of a Jesus you worship. If that is the Jesus you worship, you know that you're standing in the house of provision you know that he is blessing you but you are looking at the place and you're calling it desolate and if you are in that place right now I got two suggestions for you and in fact I would encourage you to write these two suggestions because if they don't work for you today they'll come into effect later if you feel you're in a desolate place number one if you feel you're in a desolate place go to God and tell him that you're worried Go to him. Go to him directly. Say, God, I'm worried right now. I'm in a desolate place. I don't see this Bethsaida thing. I don't see this house of provision. That's what the disciples did. When the Israelites were caught and the Egyptians were behind them, Moses went to God and said, God, we are stuck. And God said, raise your staff. And the sea parted. In 2 Kings chapter 4, when the Shunammite woman's son died, she went to the man of God because she believed God could raise him up. And the stories continue on and on and on. And the disciples went to Jesus said, God, we are caught in a place where there's so many people and there's no food. After all, isn't that what some of you have memorized? There's a verse in the Bible that says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So if, you're, if you feel you're in a desolate place, go to him. The second suggestion I have for you, if you feel like you're in a desolate place, Go to God and carefully apply His instructions. When you go to God, He's going to give you instructions. He's not going to tell you, okay, I'll take care of it. He's going to tell you, here's what you got to do. Because God wants you to have a part in His kingdom. So when you go to God, listen to His instructions and carefully apply them. Because He will bless you through that. In fact, Psalm 32 verse 8, it says, God is speaking. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And that was just a side note. Let's come back to the story. Verse 13. Again, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go out and, and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, now he, here's where the key things come, instructions. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And what if the disciples said, no, I don't feel like it. And they did, and they did so, and had them all sit down, and taking the five loaves, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to sit before the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied, and what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces now this is a side note side side bonus point for you did you notice that there were 12 disciples that went grumbling and there were 12 baskets that were picked up just saying you know i'm just saying 
that, that's how amazing our God is. But, but listen number three. Listen number three. Okay, write this down. What you bring to God, what you bring determines how much you collect. I don't know if you saw this or am I the only one who noticed this. When they go to Jesus, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Because according to Jesus, they already have everything they need. And they don't come to Jesus and say, well, we only have this. They come to Jesus and say, what do we have? Five loaves of bread and two fish. This is all we got. Because all they have is more than enough for Jesus. We as a culture, as a people, we have grown so accustomed to challenging that. We come to God and say, but God, if I had more. God, if I had more, I would do this. God, if I had more, I would do that. Don't come to God and say, God, if I had more time, I would give you some of it. Instead, come and say, God, I have an hour a week. What do you want to do with it? Don't come to God and say, God, God, if I had more money, I would give you more. Instead, come and say, God, this month, I only have $100. That's all I got. What are you going to do with it? Don't come and say, God, I'm not a preacher. If I knew more, if I knew how to preach, don't come and say that. Instead, come and say, God, God, I know how to say you love me. I know how to say this thing or that thing about you. And go, what do you want me to do with that? Don't come and say, God, if I knew more about you. Instead, say, God, this is all I know about you. What are you going to do with it? Well, we have grown so accustomed. God, if I had more, the problem is even if you had more, you wouldn't give it. Then you would say, if I had more. But what you bring to God determines how much you collect. So I want to finish today with two action steps for you. Two things I highly encourage you to take home with you to consider. Number one, we have already talked about these, okay? Number one, I want to encourage you, look for Jesus as who he is, not as who you want him to be. He is already perfect in every way. He is already more amazing than you could ever comprehend in every way. But so many of us, we try to look for Jesus as the genie in the bottle. We try to look for him as somebody who, who is not the real Jesus. And when he is silent, we become angry because we have treated him like a fool. Instead, look for him as who he really is. He is amazing. He can take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed thousands. He can touch the lame and they can walk. This God, this Jesus we serve, He is amazing. He doesn't need to change anything about Himself to be sufficient for you. Number two, go to God, give to God what you already have, okay? Don't try to embellish it. Give to God what you already have. You already have all that you need. Give to God what you already have and see what He can do to it. Listen, you may come and say, you know what, my marriage, if my marriage was better, I would, I would spend more time with God. Give your marriage to the Lord. See what He can do with it. You may say, you know what, my children, if my kids would behave a little bit better, don't do that. Give your children to the Lord and see what He can do with them. If I had more money, don't say that. Give what you already have. God doesn't ask you to give because He needs you. God doesn't want you to, to surrender those things because he, he can't live without them. He knows that the more you surrender, the more you pick up broken pieces of blessings that have fallen around that you have been blind to because you are standing in the God of provision. He is, in every sense, able to provide spiritually he can provide physically he can provide health wise he can provide bring it all to him don't come and say if i had better health use that health give that to the lord i have known more people who don't have good health share the gospel with people and lead people to salvation than those who are healthy so give what you already have to him and see what you will pick afterwards because our god is amazing so let me finish with First Chronicles. In the book of First Chronicles, when King David brings the Ark of the Covenant, he experiences, he was looking for God and experiences the blessings of God. He writes this song. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you. But in verses 8 through 11, he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wondrous works. 
glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. If you seek Him today with all of your heart, you will find Him. So I'm going to ask our prayer warriors to schedule for this service to come forward. And I want to encourage you. It doesn't matter what you are going through. Come forward. If you're dealing with health issues, bring it forward to the Lord. If you're dealing with financial issues, bring it forward to the Lord. If you're dealing with, with marital issues, bring it forward to the Lord. Whatever you are dealing with, bring it forward to the Lord because He can take care of it. And if you're in a place in your life where you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you to come forward. I want to ask you to be bold. And here's the thing. We're going to have a time of reflection in a couple of minutes, for a couple of minutes. If your life is so good and blessed, praise the Lord. You are already in the house of provision, in the God of provision. So pray for the person next to you. They are not as blessed as you. Pray for them. They don't even need to know about it. But if the Spirit of the Lord leads you to come forward, come forward. If the Spirit of the Lord leads you to kneel before Him, come kneel before Him. This is a moment where we acknowledge the King of kings, the God of provision. Let me pray for us. Father, I kneel before you. Lord, I lift your name on high. We, as your people, praise you. We praise you continually. We seek you because we know that in you there is freedom. Lord, we know that in you there is hope. Jesus, we know that in your name there is salvation. Jesus, we know that in your name there is joy. There is peace. Some of us here, we are missing those. Some of us here, we are broken. And God, we have learned to complain. We have learned to grumble about things. But what if we just bring it all to you, Lord, today? I know, Father, I know, Father, you will take it all from us. Jesus, I know there are people here who need your touch. Would you encourage them to seek you with all that they have? And then, Jesus, would you send us out of this room today as apostles, as people who are sent out to go and proclaim all that you have done, that we have seen you do. You are a God of mercy. You are a God of hope. We put our faith and trust in you, Jesus. Be glorified in our lives this week. In your precious name, I pray. Amen.